Good evening. Welcome to San Antonio Regional Hospital's Cardiovascular Community Lecture Series. I am Allison Lejean, a registered nurse and director of cardiac services, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Tonight, Dr. Duber is going to talking to be, let me try that one more time. Dr. Duber will be talking to us about heart attacks. Are you next? But before we begin, a couple of housekeeping items I'd like to go over. One is if you have any questions, please utilize the Q&A portion and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the lecture. Um, if you have a question that's a little bit more personal in nature, please feel free to send me an email. My email will be provided at the end of the lecture. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Roger Duber. Dr. Duber graduated from the College of Osteopathic Medicine and Surgery in Des Moines, Iowa. He completed his cardiovascular disease fellowship as a chief fellow at the world-renowned Cleveland Clinic Foundation. Dr. Duber is currently serving as the medical director of the cardiovascular service line at San Antonio Regional Hospital. Prior to this, he served as the medical director of non-invasive cardiology and the medical director of the cardiac catheterization lab. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Duber. Thank you, Allison, for that nice introduction. And thank you for attending our virtual community lectures that we're providing in cardiovascular diseases. Uh, as you see, this is San Antonio Regional Hospital in 2022. It's grown quite a bit over the last several years. We serve multiple uh, counties uh, in the area for cardiovascular disease. And as many of you may know, we have been named a top 50 heart care hospital in the nation. I'm very proud of that. And it took a lot of hard work by everybody involved from administration to physicians, nursing, ancillary staff, everybody involved. So what we're gonna talk about is heart disease, whether it's in a car or in a human being. Uh, this uh, event right here, that it was a heart attack in this uh, 1969 Oldsmobile 98 convertible gave me a heart attack as well. What we're gonna talk about is trying to keep your engine or your heart running well with present preventive service and good treatment. So you have an engine that runs like this. So let's talk a little bit about heart attack statistics. Cardiovascular disease remains the leading cause of death in the United States, approximately 850,000 deaths per year. The average age of the first heart attack is 66 in males, 77 in females. There's more than a million acute coronary events per year. Three-fourths of them occur for the first time. There's more than 350,000 sudden deaths per year. The costs more than $200 billion per year in this country. Interesting, I looked this up and that's increased five-fold in the last 20 years. One third of people who have a coronary event, their first symptom, unfortunately, is their last symptom. And more than 13 million people in this country alone have a history of coronary artery disease or a coronary event at this time. Now, coronary artery disease was historically used to be thought of a, as a man's disease, but it's not. It's quite prevalent in females as well. And as you can see here, it's the leading cause of death in both males and females. Now, early on, it's definitely a much more of a male problem, but once females reach menopause, you can see how they catch up and become pretty close to having a similar risk of having a cardiac event as males. Now, on one side, the risk of death from cardiovascular disease has dropped significantly in males over the years, but in females, unfortunately, for a variety of factors, it did not improve up until the last 15 to 20 years, and now they're quite similar. So we're gonna talk about who's at risk, what causes heart attacks, how do we diagnose it, how do we treat it, and how do we prevent it? First, we have to have cardiology 101, and we'll start off with anatomy. The heart is in the center of your chest. It's not way over here on the left side, and it's the center of the body. Now, the heart receives blood from veins, 
This is called the superior vena cava that drains the upper half of the body, everything above the diaphragm. This is the inferior vena cava that drains blood from everything below the diaphragm. The blood comes into the atrium, into the right ventricle, which is a pumping chamber that pushes blood into what's called the pulmonary arteries and delivers blood into the lungs, where the lungs, we uh, give it oxygen and take away carbon dioxide, return the blood that's now red back into the left side of the heart, into the main pumping chamber, which is the left ventricle. And then the left ventricle is responsible for pumping this blood out into the aorta that delivers blood to every single part of your body continuously. Now the heart has to work quite hard to do this. It beats 60 to 100 times a minute, 24 hours a day, God willing, for almost 100 years. Well, the heart has to get its own energy supply and it gets its supply through arteries itself. So it pumps blood not only to the, to the entire body, but also back to itself through coronary arteries. So coronary arteries are the arteries that deliver blood to the heart itself. And there are three major arteries are the right coronary artery that delivers blood to the bottom portion of the heart muscle. And then the left coronary artery that separates into an artery that goes to the front of the heart called the left anterior descending artery and an artery that goes behind the heart called the left circumflex artery. So again, these arteries are responsible for keeping the heart muscle itself working. But what happens if something blocks up one of those arteries? So that is what we're gonna talk about is what is coronary artery disease? Now, historically, we used to think that early on you would get a plaque or a small little amount of cholesterol in the wall of the artery and it would gradually grow and get worse and worse. And the lumen, which is this, that carries the blood, would get progressively worse. And eventually there'd be so little lumen left that it would choke off flow and a clot would form. And that this would be a very gradual process. But we started realizing that many people who had heart attacks really only had mild to moderate obstruction days or weeks earlier. And we started studying these arteries uh, in a variety of ways. And one of them is with ultrasound. And what we found was that the plaque actually begins within the wall of the artery, not inside the artery. And the plaque may grow and grow, but the lumen may not get worse until much later on. And at this point, you may have a 70% blockage, but it's stable. On the other hand, we found that many people have what's called a vulnerable plaque where the plaque becomes irritable, inflamed, and starts to break open just a little bit that induces a clot. And that clot would shut off the rest of the lumen abruptly. And so that many people who have heart attacks only had mild to moderate obstruction days to weeks earlier. Here's another example, looking at the artery through an angiogram. So we're looking at it from the outside and the lumen, which is the dark area at point A and point B look the same. If we were to look at these two areas with ultrasound, we would see the lumen is quite large here. And there's only a little amount of plaque where that yellow is on the part of the vessel within the wall. Point B, again, the lumen looks quite normal from the outside, but there's a large amount of plaque right there that you cannot see by a routine angiogram. And one can see that if this plaque became inflamed, it can induce clot formation. Now, if we look at these two spots, these two uh, diagrams, one would say this patient is much better off than this one. But the reality is this patient actually has more risk of having a heart attack than this one. Why is that? because even though this person has a 70% blockage, the plaque is very stable. It's filled with a lot of cells that are sturdy like collagen. While this artery has a lot of inflammatory cells along with cholesterol, it's very irritable and much more likely to cause that small fissure inducing clot formation. So coronary artery disease is a disease of the vessel wall, not necessarily within the lumen. And this underscores what we're saying is this was a study done over seven years 
comparing people who had less than 50% obstruction versus those who had more than 70% obstruction. And over seven years, they both had a similar chance of having a heart attack. And then one other diagram to show the same thing is, this obstruction may be 30%, it may be 70%, but what causes the heart attack is a clot forming within the remaining lumen. So what happens if the artery becomes obstructed? Well, then that portion of the heart muscle will not get enough blood flow. So this is coronary artery disease. So what are the manifestations of coronary artery disease? Well, we'll go through this, but angina pectoris, myocardial infarctions, congestive heart failure, and sudden death. So we've gone historically from the gradual progression of plaque to the vulnerable plaque, and now we'll talk about the vulnerable patient. So here's a patient who is having chest pain. Is he at risk for having a heart attack? What are the warning signs? And that's what we'll talk about. As Allison said, who's next? So angina pectoris is a symptom and it's a consequence of imbalance between supply and demand where someone may have 70% blockage and at rest, he may feel fine, but with any type of activity or exertion, the demand increases and that imbalance will cause what we call ischemia. And ischemia results in the symptom called angina pectoris. Now there's two types of angina. Basically there's patients who have stable angina, like I showed before in the diagram, someone may have a stable 70% blockage where he has symptoms with exertion, but feels fine otherwise and may have this for years. On the other hand, someone may have an unstable plaque and that patient may develop unstable angina. And unstable angina is a change in the pattern of the angina or of new onset. In other words, it happens easier, it happens more frequently, it occurs less activity to precipitate the event, that it's more intense, there's new associated symptoms. All of this could be unstable angina or if it just started recently. And this frequently signals an impending heart attack. Heart attack, we call that myocardial infarction. Myocardium means heart muscle, infarction means death. And it's due to a lack of blood flow. Congestive heart failure is the inability of the heart to adequately pump out enough blood with each heartbeat. This results in inadequate flow to the body and more commonly the blood backing up into the lungs where you get very short of breath. And typically this is due to excessive heart muscle damage. So here's a patient who may have had a heart attack right here. And depending upon the amount of damage, he may have congestive heart failure early on, or if he makes it through the hospitalization, he may not have any problems for weeks to months. And lo and behold, later on, he has a very enlarged and weak heart muscle due to a term we call remodeling. And then unfortunately, um, the first symptom of heart disease may be the last symptom. So who's at risk for having an event? Well, we know risk factors include smoking, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, obesity, age, and family history. And we know that these risk factors are additive. The more risk factors that you have, the higher your risk. If we take diabetes, or if you have any evidence of vascular disease in your carotids or in your legs or anywhere else, that in itself is a separate category. That means that you are a coronary equivalent. It means you have as much risk of having a heart attack as someone who's already had a heart attack. We use these risk factors uh, to try to stratify what your risk is. And there's a, a very uh, well-known scoring uh, stratification that we use called the Framingham Risk Score, where we use age, total cholesterol, smoking, uh, the good cholesterol, uh, blood pressure, and we tally the points. So if we look at myself, we see I'm 25 years old, and then my score would probably be uh, Dr. Duber, you might want to recalculate that score a little bit. I think you're off a little bit on your age, a little. Well, based <laughs> on that then, if we, re 
you change my age, even though I may have to argue with you, uh, then my score would be about 14 or 15. My risk is about 5% over the next 10 years. And thank you for that input, Allison. It was very well appreciated. <laughs> so using the Framingham risk score, we break it down to three major levels, less than 10%, 10 to 20%, and greater than 20%. And inclusive of greater than 20%, the high risk over the next 10 years, also includes anybody who's ever had a coronary heart event, a diabetic, or anybody has any type of vascular disease, automatically in the highest category. All right, so how do we diagnose coronary artery disease and how do we predict coronary events? The symptoms of coronary artery disease classically is chest pain. You may have shortness of breath, fatigue, passing out, or sudden death. Chest pain. The chest pain of heart disease is typically in the center of your chest. It's a diffuse area. If someone says, I'm having pain like this, a poking pain, or they use one finger like this, rarely is that due to your heart. It's usually a diffuse discomfort. The discomfort may spread to your left or both arms or down, both shoulders or down the arms. Interestingly, if someone ever says they have discomfort in both arms, almost always that's the heart. If they say it's the left arm or right arm, can be due to the heart. But when someone says it's both arms, very commonly that is due to the heart. Other thing that's interesting is that some people may only have symptoms in an arm or an elbow and not the chest is all, at all. In fact, one of the first heart attacks I saw when I was in training the patient only had discomfort in his left elbow, nowhere else, and he ended up having a massive heart attack. And this is more common, unfortunately, in diabetics who have atypical symptoms or no symptoms at all. And this is a common a scenario uh, where someone may have stable angina. He is now walking up the stairs. He has increased physical exertion. It's cold, it's after a meal, he just finished his cigarette and he's carrying his work with them. So he has increased stress. So all of these are a variety of, of uh, precipitating factors causing him to have angina. And frequently there's associated symptoms, as I mentioned, such as breaking out to a sweat, nausea, weakness, shortness of breath, a sense of impending doom. Now there's other things that can cause chest pain, such as from your lungs, your esophagus, your stomach, your pancreas, your gallbladder, your duodenum, uh, as well as the chest wall itself within the sternum, the ribs, what we call costochondritis. So sometimes it can be difficult to decipher, but we should leave it to the professionals to try to figure out what is the cause of the chest pain. Some people have no symptoms at all. So how do we diagnose it then? So it starts off by seeing the doctor and getting a good history. A history is critical because sometimes people don't realize that they are having symptoms of heart disease. And of course, within the history, we want to see what their risk factors are. An EKG is frequently helpful. A normal EKG does, a normal EKG does not rule out heart disease, but an abnormal EKG showing previous heart attacks definitely rules it in. And surprisingly, up to 15% of people who have heart attacks have no symptoms. And the first evidence of it is on an EKG. Blood tests can show if someone is at risk for having a heart attack. So let's say someone is at risk, then what do we do? Well, historically, we do exercise treadmill tests to try to induce that imbalance between supply and demand, what we call ischemia. And we would have this patient hooked up to an EKG and see if we can induce that imbalance between supply and demand. And this test, depending upon the situation, is reliable 75, 80% of the time, depending upon this situation. Sometimes we need additional visualization to see if there's an imbalance and we have ways to look at the heart with not only the EKG, but nuclear scanning and what we call PET scanning and echocardiography and cardiac uh, MRI. So there's a variety of ways we can visualize the heart better. 
above and beyond just the routine treadmill tests. Some people cannot exercise. Many people can't uh, due to a variety of factors such as arthritis. And so we use an intravenous agent to what we call exercise the heart and try to induce this imbalance between supply and demand and look and see how the heart is being perfused with a stressful situation and see if we can reproduce that ischemia. Now, this is a very interesting test. We started realizing this back in the 60s and 70s with angiograms, where we started seeing what looked like little flecks of white within the arteries of the, part, uh, of the heart when people had coronary artery disease. And we started to realize that this was calcium. And this become, became much easier to see when CAT scans became readily available in the 70s and 80s. And you can see calcium here within the arteries of the heart. And we started to realize that this may be, may be very important. And we started to realize that the only way that calcium can get in the artery is if you have plaque in the artery. And if you have no plaque, the calcium cannot get there. And soon thereafter, in the last 20 years, we've started to quantify how much calcium is in the arteries of the heart. And we realized the higher the amount of calcium, the more significant it was. And one can see here that if your coronary calcium score is zero or near zero, the risk of you having an event in the next 10 years is extremely low. But the more calcium you have in the arteries of the heart, the higher your risk is. And you can easily see how that this test can help us with, let's say the Framingham risk score we just talked about. So this can further stratify patients from medium back to, for instance, if you're a medium risk and your score is zero, then you probably would be considered a low risk. While if you were considered a low risk and your calcium score was high, you may be considered an intermediate or even high risk. So this is a very good supplemental uh, study to help screen patients for coronary artery disease. Now, a newer technique that's been available for the last 10 to 15 years is called CT angiography, where we use contrast intravenously to picture the arteries of the heart. And this can give us a beautiful demonstration of the arteries of the heart, where they are, and can identify blockages very well. And you can see how much of a appearance that these arteries have, how well-defined they can be. And we're looking at it not only from the outside, but we can actually look at it from the inside of the arteries and see if there's any plaque and how much there is. So we can, to a certain degree, have an estimate of severity of blockages by doing this, what we call CTA, which is CT angiography of the coronary arteries. And then finally, there are certain people that end up requiring an a cardiac catheterization or an angiogram where you inject dye into the arteries of the heart. Obviously, this patient's in big trouble, has a 99% blockage. You may be able to picture that this patient had a severe uh, plaque that ruptured. You can see that little space in there and the plaque ruptured and induced clot right in there, shutting off the artery. Now, does everyone with coronary arteries get a heart attack? Of course not. Uh, many, many people in this country and throughout the world have coronary artery disease and will never ever have an event. But there are people who are at risk as we talked about. But how do we try to predict the next coronary event? Are there tests that we can utilize to say, you're at risk in the near future? And we've looked at various tests. One of the things to go back on is what causes heart attacks is that plaque becoming vulnerable. And how does it become vulnerable? Because it becomes inflamed, that there's a lot of inflammatory cells that makes that plaque wall irritable and brittle that releases the clot, causing the vessel to shut off. So if there's inflammation here, maybe there are tests to identify that you're at risk. And one of the tests that we use is called highly sensitive CRP. And we know that the higher the level, the greater your risk of having a heart attack in the future. And if we use it along with the bad, um, bad cholesterol, we can further stratify who is at higher risk. The problem is we don't know what, when that event can occur. Is it tomorrow, is it next year, or is it five years from now? And because of that, the test is interesting, but not clinically that useful other than 
we know that the patients who are at the high risk, we need to be most aggressive with in trying to prevent an event. All right, so now let's talk about how do we treat heart attacks. Again, if you have a blockage here, that portion of the heart muscle will die. If the blockage is 100%, you have about four hours before this uh, muscle will become irreversibly damaged. So therapy, historically was making arrangements, let's say at Draper or at other places because there was nothing else we could do. Back in the 60s, we started to hospitalize patients for heart attacks and we would give them comfort and try to make them comfortable, but we really had very little else to offer these patients. Frequently, we would keep them in the hospital for up to three weeks at a time. Then the 1970s occurred. Now, until this occurred, our mortality rate for heart attacks was about 30%. But when we started putting patients in the hospital, we started seeing that many of them died and we felt there had to be something we could do to prevent this. And we developed a certain portion of the hospital specialized for heart disease and further specialized to take care of patients who were having heart attacks. And those areas were called the coronary care units. And when we developed these units, they were, they were, they were um, taken care of by nurses that were trained in cardiovascular disease and nothing else. This was their specialty. Concomitantly, we developed equipment that could monitor the patients and look at their heart rhythm while they were in the hospital for heart attacks because we realized the most common cause for death from heart attacks once you made it to the hospital were arrhythmias, causing them to die suddenly. In addition, patients would die from congestive heart failure or a rupture of heart muscle. So what could we do about the arrhythmias? Well, the first thing we did was develop a, uh, an EKG strapped to them so we could monitor their heart rhythm continuously, and we would see this. But at the same time, we developed medications that could hopefully prevent these heart irregularities from occurring, or we would have defibrillators at bedside where we could shock them out of these lethal arrhythmias, or we also developed the ability to put pacemakers in at bedside and within the matter of minutes, saving patients whose heart stopped. And literally overnight, mortality from heart attacks dropped from about 30% to 15%. And more people were saved from this than probably anything else, including probably penicillin. Well, the second major cause of death was a weak heart muscle or congestive heart failure. And some people had so much damage early on that the rest of the heart muscle could not compensate and they had congestive heart failure and died from that. Some of the patients had some damage, were able to survive the index hospitalization, but later on, Weeks to months later, their heart muscle became so weak that they developed severe congestive heart failure and died later on. And here's a patient who may have survived his initial event, but a year later died. And you can see how dilated and obviously weak this heart muscle was. And then the third major thing was rupture of the heart muscle, where it didn't take necessarily a large heart attack, but it had to be in an area that was in a bad spot and it spread to the outside where the muscle would suddenly rupture. And unfortunately, I've seen several cases over the years where patients were doing quite well, actually be talking to them, and then 10 minutes later be dead with a normal heart rhythm. So now that we've taken care of the arrhythmias, how can we reduce the heart muscle damage? And we go back to the drawing board, we try to figure out how can we either reduce demand or increase supply? Because the extent of the damage of the heart muscle determines your short as well as long-term prognosis. So we said, okay, here's demand and supply. What can we do about it? Can we improve demand? Can we improve supply? Well, to reduce demand, we looked at rest and sedation and that really had minimal effect. And we tried a variety of medications. And then finally in the 1970s, we developed a class of medication that we were using for blood pressure called beta blockers. And you can sort of think of this as anti-adrenaline medications. And these medicines reduce the heart rate, they reduce the blood pressure, 
and they reduced the force of contraction of the heart muscle. And they showed that these medications were extremely effective in reducing events, including mortality. And this class of medication by itself reduced mortality from about 15% down to 12%, but still way too high. Too many people were dying from heart attacks. So we looked at the other side. How can we improve supply? Oxygen really doesn't do anything and medications to dilate a totally obstructed vessel had no benefit. So back in the late 1970s, a group out of Spokane, Washington, led by Marcus DeWood, thought, why don't we just do emergency bypass surgery in these patients? Well, that was considered heresy at the time. In fact, we never even did emergency angiograms on those patients. What they did was they started doing emergency angiograms on patients who came in with heart attacks. And what they found, first of all, was what caused the heart attack was 100% blockage because that wasn't really proven beforehand. And they also proved that it was due to a clot. So, and then they also proved that you could do an angiogram safely in a person who was having a heart attack. So they proved three things. And then they sent the patient for emergency bypass surgery. And what they found was that these patients who were able to present early enough after the onset of symptoms and had bypass surgery did much better, had a much lower mortality, not only early on and made it through the hospitalization with a much lower mortality rate, but years later, when they did a follow-up study, and 10 years later, they still had a much lower uh, mortality rate versus those who did not receive bypass surgery. Well, there had to be an easier way to do that. And in fact, uh, there was a doctor named Sal Sherry back in 1959, says, why don't we give clot-busting medication to these patients? And then they used a medicine called streptokinase, and we give it very slowly over 24 hours. And remember, at those days, they didn't even have coronary care units. But he showed that there was some benefit, but not enough people believed him. Well, the next step back in the 1980s, and the Germans started doing this quite prevalently, was they started doing emergency angiograms on patients who had heart attacks, and they would give clot-busting medication through the catheter. So here's someone who was having a heart attack due to 100% blockage in his right coronary artery, gave the clot busting medication and opened up the artery. Well, the next step was to go back and give the clot busting medication intravenously, but a much more potent type of clot busting medication and a much more brisk way. And now we commonly use this in many parts of the world when other modalities are not available, such as emergency open heart surgery, uh, to open up this artery, and it works about 60 to 70% of the time. So it definitely has a role throughout the country and the world. Well, the next step was, uh, we know that we can open up the artery with some success with clot busting medication. And then we started opening up the arteries with a balloon called angioplasty. And that was soon followed thereafter by putting stents in a totally occluded artery to open it up. And by doing that, we have been very successful in restoring blood flow. And if we get them soon enough, we can really significantly reduce damage to the heart muscle and mortality. And this is an accepted modality here in Southern California, throughout the United States and throughout the world. And this is an example of our team working in Bolivia on a patient who was having a heart attack years ago and a very nice, nice result as well. So we've gone from 30% mortality down to 15% then 12%. And now with using angioplasty and then stents, 5%, even three to 5% mortality rate with patients who can get to the hospital in a timely fashion. Both early on and late mortality have been reduced significantly. For every 100 patients that showed up, 13 to 15 patients are saved. We also know that some patients did much better than others. And who did better? The ones who came in earlier. We started really realizing that time was muscle. And the sooner you could get to these patients, the better results that they would have. Well, there's a problem with that. If a patient has chest discomfort, first of all, they have to realize that it might be a heart problem. Then they call for the ambulance with 911. The ambulance comes, does an EKG, has to take the patient to the hospital. Then what we used to do is you'd be evaluated, do another EKG, and then we'd see if the patient was having a heart attack. Then we'd try to call 
uh, a cardiologist to evaluate the patient, and then they would call the cath lab, and hours could go by. And we realized that many, many patients could benefit with a much more efficient system. And that was, the system was called the door to balloon system or door to balloon time, where the goal was to achieve less than 90 minutes between the onset of symptoms and opening up the artery. So if someone has symptoms, let's say at two o'clock in the morning, calls 911, the ambulance gets there at 2.05 and does the EKG at 2.10 a.m. identifying a heart attack, that heart attack is trans, I'm sorry, that EKG is then transmitted to the emergency room and that, that starts to clock at 90 minutes, or within 90 minutes, we expect to have a balloon opening up that artery, restoring blood flow. And this is our goal throughout the country. It takes a, what we call a team approach to treat patients, starting with the ambulances, the emergency room, and the cath lab. That's inclusive of nursing, the EKG checks, respiratory techs, everybody involved, and of course, the physicians as well, working with the team. So again, we've gone quite a way, and this statistic is, is old. We're much better now, under 5% most of the time. So now that we know how we treat heart attacks, finally, how do we try to prevent heart attacks? Well, it starts off with your genes and family history, unfortunately, or fortunately, you can't do anything about your genes. It is what, these are the cars that we're dealt with. But there are things that we can do to lower our risk and modify our risk factors. Cholesterol with diet and medication, blood pressure with diet and medication, of course, stopping smoking and regular exercise. We know that for every 1% decline in blood pressure, there can be up to a two to 4% reduction in coronary events. For every 1% reduction in total cholesterol, there can be a 1% reduction in coronary events. Smoking is bad for a variety of reasons. You don't get many dates with them lately. But in addition to that, it's a definite major risk factor for heart disease. Would it be nice if you could just go through the body shop and uh, lower your body mass? The bad news is about a third of both men and women are either obese or overweight in this country. It's a very bad statistic and it shows that we uh, eat too well and don't exercise enough. And these are things that have to be emphasized between the patient and the physician. Regular exercise. We know that people who exercise, on a, exercise and I mean cardio exercise, whatever it is, uh, on a frequent basis, ideally daily, have more than a 50% reduction of coronary events. So if you are a diabetic, you already know you have a seven to 10% risk of having a heart attack and per year. By doing this, you have lowered your risk by 50%. Sometimes people say that the risk may be too high uh, with too much exercise. Well, that's a matter of um, discussion. Alcohol, well, red wine is usually recommended for heart disease, but we actually know that any type of alcohol has, is helpful up to a limit. We know one or two alcohol beverages, uh, limited beverages per day can lower risk in men and one in women. Uh, commonly asked is who should be on statins to prevent heart disease or coronary events. Anyone who's had a previous coronary event should be on a statin. That means heart attacks, angina, bypass surgery, angioplasty stents, anyone who's had an event should be on a statin. Anyone who has peripheral vascular disease or carotid vascular disease should be on a uh, statin. Diabetics, because of their high risk, should be on a statin. If you have a very high cholesterol early on, people feel that you should be on a statin. Now, coronary calcium scores is interesting. Uh, there's two schools of thought. If you have a score less than 10, some people feel that you don't need to be on statin therapy, that risk modification should suffice. Others feel that the longer you are exposed to high cholesterol, the, regardless of your coronary calcium score, that the higher your risk is long-term. That's something to that discuss between the patient and the uh, physician but statins do have a significant role, not only in reducing cholesterol, but statins reduce heart attacks 
where many other agents that do reduce cholesterol fail. This is a fascinating slide on patients who are at risk for having a heart attack. And if you look within the first several days, uh, first 20, 30 days, there was already a separation of curves between those who received it and those who did not receive statins to reduce the risk of having a heart attack. Well, how can that be? It's not just from lowering cholesterol. What statins do is they have an anti-inflammatory effect on the plaque itself. They reduce inflammation and they also gradually replace the morphology of the plaque. They replace those inflammatory cells with sturdy cells like collagen so that the plaque becomes much less likely to fissure or rupture, inducing the clot and heart attack. So statins are very effective for reducing events. So this is just an example of the inflammation within the plaque. So finally, how do we prevent heart attacks? Periodic doctor visits, behavioral modification with exercise and diet, Aspirin, what role does aspirin have? And that's gotten a lot of attention lately. If a patient, if someone is at low risk, you know, under 10% using a Framingham risk score has not had any events, routine aspirin therapy may or may not have a role. And that's something to be discussed between the physician and the patient. But those who are in intermediate and high risk or those people who have already had an event, aspirin still suffices for primary prevention therapy. Aggressive treatment for hypertension, as we talked about, is very helpful. Treatment for high cholesterol, as we talked about statins. And statins by itself, up until several years ago, I would have said it was the only real good treatment for reducing event as well as cholesterol. But there's a new class of medication for patients who either cannot tolerate statins or statins by themselves are unsuccessful in achieving goals. And that's with the class of medications uh, that are either a DNA and now messenger RNA uh, um, may, uh, mediated. And these drugs that are used every two weeks to every six months have been shown to not only dramatically reduce the bad cholesterol, but also have been shown to reduce heart events. And then finally, there's those patients who require intervention with either angioplasty and stents or bypass surgery. So in summary, Try not to get heart disease in the first place with diet and exercise and taking care of your risk factors. However, there are some people who remain at risk and have symptoms, recognize it and take care of it. Don't deny that you're having a problem. And finally, if you are having symptoms of a heart attack, take care of it fast. Call the pros, call 911, let them do their job so you can have a well running machine. Do what it takes to keep the engine running well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Deba, for that very informative lecture. We really appreciate it. Um, and we do have quite a few questions. Uh, the first one is, can you tell me more about the coronary calcium score and at what age should you have that testing done? Okay. Since we now know I'm not 25, I've already <laughs> had my score done. Um, historically, okay. we used to do a um, stress test. And if a patient had a normal stress test, he would walk out of the office thinking his arteries were perfectly normal. Well, we just realized that you could have a normal stress test, but have a little bit of plaque. Well, the patient would say, well, that's no big deal. You know, even if I have a little bit of plaque, so what? But that plaque's going to get worse. And it also means that you are at risk for having a heart attack in the future at some time. What's even more interesting is that you could have this much plaque in the arteries of your heart, but as long as enough blood flow gets through, the stress test looks perfectly normal, but yet there's that much plaque. Well, the other thing that's interesting is that this plaque, as I said, seems to have a propensity for sucking up calcium from the blood and it absorbs within the plaque. And that's the things that we can see on this CT scan or what we call a coronary calcium score. So this, this test is extremely helpful for screening for coronary artery disease. If you have calcium in the arteries, the only way you can have that is if you have plaque in the arteries of your heart. And if you have no calcium, that means at that point in time, you have no significant plaque. Now, the exception is, is to the second part of your question. If you are under the age of uh, 15 females and under the age of 40, 
the plaque may not have had enough time to absorb calcium. So the plaque may not show any calcium. That's why this test is not as reliable in younger people. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, would taking an oral contraceptive for over 10 years increase your risk of developing heart disease? Um, that depends upon the type of the contraceptive um, and other risk factors. At this time, uh, cardiologists do not advise either one way or another to take them or not to take them, depending upon what other factors are involved, including the symptoms that they are um, experiencing. Okay, thank you. Uh, women are told to get mammograms at age 40, and in general, people need to get a colon cancer screening too. At what age should people get cardiac workups like EKGs, echoes, and stress tests? I think, again, that depends upon a lot of things. Uh, if someone is uh, perfectly healthy and has a low risk score, um, I think screening for heart disease uh, early on in their 30s and 40s, other than checking their cholesterol levels, probably... Uh, it doesn't help that much above and beyond having a good lifestyle. But the more risk factors you have, the more aggressive and earlier on, you should check a patient um, to see if they are at risk. Very good, thank you. Um, I've been told I have an extra heart artery. Do I still need to worry about heart disease like normal people or do I have an added risk factor? I'm not sure if I can answer that without seeing exactly what the anatomy was. An extra artery may be an extra branch of a vessel. Uh, arteries can actually uh, occur in a variety of ways, just like uh, everyone has a different uh, handprint or fingerprint, everyone has different uh, anatomy of their coronary arteries to a certain degree. Interestingly, one of the anomalies of coronary artery is when uh, an artery comes off uh, or two arteries come off the same side. And sometimes that can cause one of the arteries to go in an abnormal route and make them at increased risk for having sudden death. But those are rare situations. Um, and for the most part, everybody falls into uh, the mainstream of uh, anatomy of heart disease. Thank you very much. Uh, what effects have you seen from those who survived COVID in both young and older patients? And what do you suspect are the long-term effects? Anything and everything when it comes to COVID. And uh, with a lot of things we don't know and may not ever know about COVID. But what we do know is that COVID can affect the heart in a variety of ways. It can have a direct effect on the heart muscle called myocarditis. It can have an inflammatory effect on the sac of the heart called pericarditis. It can cause increased clotting causing a heart attack. It can cause a stress situation called Takotsubo syndrome or stress cardiomyopathy, where the heart will look like having a heart attack, but it's not, but it goes through an acute phase that may last for days. Most of the time, the mortality is very low, but it can be extremely scary. It can also affect it indirectly. Uh, COVID, unfortunately, it does cause a very significant pro-clotting phenomenon that causes pulmonary embolism or clots in the lungs that causes acute strain on the heart. It causes high fevers and shock due to a variety of mechanisms that makes it extremely difficult for the heart to try to keep up with the tremendous increased demand. So COVID can affect the um, heart in a variety of ways, both directly and indirectly, both short-term and long-term. Can a, a primary care physician order a coronary calcium score? Yes, primary care physician can easily order that. Uh, we, and many hospitals throughout the country do it for a small nominal fee. At San Antonio Regional Hospital, we do it for $100. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, insurances and Medicare do not cover that cost most of the time, but it's an excellent, excellent screening tool uh, that can be done in the matter of minutes. Thank you. Would it be common to experience pain in the wrist area after a heart attack? After a heart attack, no, that's usually not a symptom after a heart attack. But as I said before, uh, wrist pain or elbow pain may be a symptom of heart disease or having a heart attack. 
Oh, what should be the ideal weight or BMI for a good heart health? Um, a good BMI probably should be under 29. Very good. Um, how does diabetes impact your heart? Well, as we said, diabetes is a coronary equivalent. You have diabetes, you have as much risk of having a heart attack as someone who's already had a heart attack. And that means your risk is about seven to 10 times as high as someone who's not a diabetic. Second problem with diabetes is frequently it affects multiple areas and all three arteries of your heart. So it's a diffuse problem. that are less likely to require angioplasty or stent, more likely to require bypass surgery. And in fact, there's a lot of studies that have shown over the years that bypass surgery may have uh, a lower mortality rate long-term than angioplasty or stent, depending upon the extent of disease. The third problem with diabetics is that frequently they have atypical symptoms or no symptoms at all. And up to 30% of diabetics may have a heart attack without realizing it. So it's a very difficult problem with diabetics. We have to be very aggressive in treating them, reducing risk factors, risk modification, periodic evaluation, and making the patient aware how uh, much higher risk they are and how much uh, more important it is to take care of themselves and to let us be aware of any symptoms that should occur. And the final question is, does vaping have the same effect or, as smoking or impact as smoking? I'm sorry, does what, vaping? Vaping. You know, I, I don't know if I can answer that. I think it does from what I have read, vaping is as bad as tobacco. Okay. So, probably shouldn't do either. <laughs> Very good advice, thank you. Well, thank you again, Dr. Duber, for this wonderful lecture. And I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us this evening. And we hope to see you again next week. Have a wonderful night.